fortunately being so bewildered with many, many pressures on my brain, seeing all these people behave so treasonous, it was just too much for me to put together, but uh, uh, I now know what he was telling me, and it'll happen, if the plane gets in the air even. So, my opinion is that we be kind to children and be kind to seniors and take the portion like they used to take in ancient Greece and step over quietly because we are not committing suicide. It's a revolutionary act. We can't go back. They won't leave us alone. They're now going back to tell more lies, which means more congressmen. And there's no way, no way we can survive. As kids, we were taught to how you endure torture. Um, and we were taught death from an early age when I joined in 13. So I never thought I'd see 21. Um, and then as things got worse in Jonestown, Jim kept saying, the guy needs liberation. Now they're the enemy. And they'll be coming in with tanks Community. and guns. And he so, was a predator. Yeah. Jim Jones was a predator. So he prayed specifically as one of the participants said, he preyed on African-Americans because of their faith. Hi, this is Dr. Michelle, and I want to welcome everyone to another episode of Tabernacle Talks. And today, we're just continuing our discussions about the Jonestown Massacre. And we've actually have someone in our studio audience today that's going to be asking us some pretty tough questions and joining in the discussion. Uh, I want to welcome Ann Logan, and I want to welcome and our return guest, Dr. Wendy Edmonds. Hi, Dr. Hey, Edmonds. Everyone. Wonderful. Okay, we, we saw in segment one, uh, when we heard from Leslie Wagner, about the challenges that she had in terms of escaping and the challenges that she met in this country upon returning. Uh, we then in the second segment heard from Dr. Edmonds about this whole notion of toxic followership. So I think before we kind of jump in and start having our discussion, Dr. Edmonds, can you give us a refresher on what toxic followership is? Yes, I always want to make sure that everyone understands the context in which I'm speaking of toxic followership. And I define toxic followership as a trusted leader who manipulates the mindset of others to the extreme um, obedience to the point that the followers begin to mimic the behavior of the toxic leader. They act like them, they, be, they uh, make decisions like them, and they will even give their life for that individual, that toxic leader. Now, that's interesting you say that because when I looked up the term, and we hear this a lot, that when people get into cults, there's an element of brainwashing. And when I looked up the term brainwashing, it said you have to obliterate the target's identity. So basically you deconstruct who they are yes. and then you replace it with behaviors or attitudes or feelings that would probably never have been their own had you not just completely obliterated their sense of identity. So I guess I want to pick on Anne a little bit because I know throughout time there have been toxic leaders, even in the Bible. Uh, we, we've been warned about false prophets. We've had prolific writings from people that talk about there will be these false uh, people that will come into our lives and fool us. Why do you think it still continues to happen? Because people, I think they have a need to want to be part of a bigger group. Um, here's an example. I have two individuals. Um, one is family member. Uh, one is a friend's uh, daughter. They have been in, I want to say, a followship 
of that sort. Um, they were extremely brilliant women, college bound, um, in fact, college ed educated ladies, uh, beautiful, uh, one was a model. And uh, in a period of, I would say two years, when I seen them both, they were both uh, totally different. I don't mean, um, oh, leave me alone. I don't wanna be bothered. Their conversations were extremely uh, volatile. Mm -hmm. uh, you might see um, the one person she would, um, she would not talk for a period of time. And then when she was visiting, and then all of a sudden she'd come out with this uh, warfare and uh, they're trying to do things to us and they're giving us medications. And she just rattle on with different conversations within a short period of time. You might hear six or eight different conversations within 10 minutes. And I think, um, at least I know the one that was a family member was looking for um, something that she didn't have because she was away from home and she went out on the streets. And I think she got involved with one of those organizations. In fact, I know she did. And um, it became, I, I, this has been 10 years ago and it's still not clear as to what's going on with her, either one of them. Wow. Now, Dr. Edmonds, how did you come up with the term toxic followership? Yes, I, I want to say that I, I'm absolutely sorry for your family member and, and the other person and all of those who are out there um, who have been, uh, who have become victims of someone, a, a leader with no, just morally bankrupt right mm -hmm. and so how did I come up with toxic followership when I interviewed the survivors of the Jonestown massacre there really wasn't any um, evidence of just following someone just because they believed in this person there were different reasons why they followed Jim Jones. Some were children and had no choice. Mm -hmm. And then some of their parents followed Jim Jones for different reasons. So Jim Jones, remember, had these fake healing sessions, but no one knew they were fake except the colluders who helped to uh, make this whole pretend healing service seem like a reality. And so who doesn't want to be healed from an illness? When you have a child who is wayward and this pastor has this special power to heal, why would you not think that this is the place when other people are saying that they have been healed? They have seen their examples of the manifestations of this healing service even though those lies were just that and it wasn't the truth, it was enough to follow. So that was a total exploitation of the scriptures. Well, and you're right, because in the scriptures, we know that people were healed. Yes. And so it's unfortunate that that level of manipulation occurs that I'm going to stage healing so that people will think I have this kind of divine power. Help us understand, because these were African-Americans. The majority of the followers were African-Americans. And I don't believe us to be uh, people that are not discerning, you know, right. and, and, and need more evidence to trust. What was happening, did you find, in that time in the 70s that just made them look for an out or an escape? Were they running from something or running to something? So that's hard to say. Again, every situation was so different. What I will say is that when we collectively 
find a good thing, we share it with our families. Which is why when the massacre took place, that, that, that awful, dreadful day, November 18th, 1978, generations of family members perished. That was sisters, uncles, aunts, grandparents. You're talking about wiping out generations of people, of a, the same family. And so while I know from research that he did prey on the, the poor um, and for, for his reasons, the main contact that he wanted was because of their belief in God. So I'm gonna provide just what brings them together. And so we have to be mindful of what we, what we believe God to be. So we have to look in ourselves and really think about what we are looking for when we go to church. And that's how things get missed, right? It's all about deception. So he was whatever someone wanted him to be, he was to them, he was the healer. He had them call him father. He had that closeness. You're missing, I'm dead. So he became um, what was missing in some people's lives. And then the radical movement of, yes, we are going to do something that nobody else has ever done. And when you are part of a movement, you become part of a movement. You believe in that movement. You will do anything to support that movement. And that's how a lot of them followed him as well. Remember, that was the time when we were just coming out of the 60s, the radical movement that it took to change laws and policies in this country. I had the opportunity to meet another survivor and she was actually able to leave the camp a year prior to the massacre. And she used the term, she was able to negotiate mm. her release. And that was an interesting term because it was clear you didn't feel free to go there were conditions placed on her leaving. Did any of that come out in your focus group at all? None of that came out because those that participated in the focus group were never able to negotiate an out. Um, so that's the difference. They were never able to, when uh, we think about Leslie's story, her story is that we're going on a picnic. Mm. Right, that's not negotiations. That is telling this story to save your life and the life of your child and the life of those with you who are trying to get away. We've all been in leadership positions and I know I've been in leadership positions and you've been in leadership positions and we've all had toxic followers. So even when I think of from a leadership standpoint, when you've had that follower that maybe is so vocal and so negative and they they create a spirit of and you think well, where does that come from but then I think this is different because in this case intoxicated followers is the term that you used yes intoxicating came from one the one of the participants who made a comment and said, being a part of Jonestown, being a part of People's Temple, that movement in itself was intoxicating. There were times when I felt absolutely invigorated, just, just excited to be a part. And then there were times where I was so intoxicated, my head was spinning when I began to see the things that, that I knew weren't right. When I saw the things that Jim Jones was doing, and I knew it was wrong. When I heard him say things across the pulpit had nothing to do with God, I knew it was wrong. So there was, it was both sides of feeling intoxicated. 
And it was from one extreme to the other. Well, Ann, you had an opportunity. You watched uh, both segments. Was there anything new that you learned about the Jonestown massacre that maybe you didn't know before you saw the segments? Um, yes and no. Um, I was, okay, at the time, I was, um, oh gosh, uh, my son was only four years old. And um, it was, I was focused on him and really not focused on Jonestown at the time. I knew it was a tragedy, but I didn't realize it, the majority of the um, congregation was African-American. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't realize that some of his top leaders were not African-American. They were government officials, according to what I uh, listened mm -hmm. to. Um, I didn't realize that, again, uh, cyanide and grape juice. I mean, we heard all kinds of different things, but we never heard the cyanide part. We It was like, you know, uh, they just went out and did this on their own. We didn't realize that, I myself didn't realize that they were in a, um, situations such as the, um, what were the ones in Texas in that camp? Branch Davidians, the Branch yeah. Davidians. Uh, absolutely. I didn't realize that it was that mind altering. I thought it was maybe like, okay, he paid all these people to go with him and, you know, they got to leave whenever they wanted to. And then sometime later, um, I didn't connect the um, senator that had gone there to investigate what was going on. And I didn't connect his death with uh, um, the conspiracy, the guy that got on the plane and actually killed all of those people that were leaving or had left. You know, so it was a lot, it was very eye opening for me. Um, I wanted, to, I had a question that I was gonna ask uh, Ms. Wagner when, uh, she was, uh, I was hoping that she was going to be on because when she talked about going that 30 miles and how she, you know, crawled her way up that mountain, by the time she got finished, I was out of breath. You know, like, wow, she had me so intense into what she was saying that um, I, I, I thought, okay, now you're at the top and all of a sudden you hear this voice that says, it's going to be all right. So what was God telling her? How was he telling her? What direction was he asking her to go in in order to, you know, uh, find her freedom, you know, find what she needed, you know, to, um, to move forward? Because uh, God has to give that to you. You can't just get to a point in your life and say, if you hear the, the voice of God and say, he says, oh, it's going to be okay. It's going to be fine. But then he also has to move you in a direction to show you what way to go. You know, you just can't go willy-nilly and think you're going to make it because there's so many different directions that you could go. And, well, you know, what's also interesting about that is that she heard that that voice, that, that mm -hmm. still quiet voice in the yes. midst of all of this that's going on. And so I think about myself, where it'll be something very simple, you know, don't take the beltway, mm -hmm. take whatever this other route is. And you often think it's just you. Mm -hmm. So you just, okay, I'll go ahead and do it. And then you hear on the radio, there's a two hour backup on 495. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, yes. But, you know, sometimes- Mm -hmm. Right with, with things around you happening, you can miss that voice, or mm -hmm. it is so familiar that you're you 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 think that's just me. Let me just go ahead mm -hmm. and hop on the beltway. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think it's even more um, amazing to me that with the exhaustion from the physical activity of walking thirty-seven miles, mm -hmm. crawling with great fear across a bridge. Your baby is strapped to your back, mm -hmm. sleep deprived, nutrition deprived, and you hear the voice of God and you know it. Mm -hmm. 
Sounds like here. The sheep know the voice of the shepherd. Right. Real. That's what was real to me about that story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you bring up an interesting point because when I first heard that story, I thought about Harriet Tubman and I thought, here we are in 1978. Mm -hmm. And this sounds like people escaping from a plantation. Mm -hmm. And there were so many you know, examples that she gave of similarities between their captivity, because they, right. they weren't, they were captive as far as mm -hmm. I was concerned, and their escape. And I thought this was 1978. And you would think that this could never, ever, ever happen again. And then a few years that. later, it did. Yeah, mm -hmm. again. And remember that 1978 you know, you think about the music at that time. I, it always takes me back because I was in high school. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, everybody remembers high school, the song for your graduation. Mm -hmm. Everything is going on. And you're just having fun as a child, as a teenager. You know, where's the next party? What's <laughs> the next fashion? Is my daddy going to bring me home some material so I can make my clothes for the weekend. I, I, I made my own clothes. I mean, those were the kinds of things that was on my mind. And then when this happened, I turned to the TV and see this, I was stunned. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was stunned. And with all that we knew at that time in 1978, this can could, could have happened. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about how even now, people don't always know that 75% of those who perished were African Americans. Why? Why is it not a national mourning? That was the first time this had ever happened in this country. Mm -hmm. Why is it that they have to raise money for a memorial? to a group of, of people who believed in serving their God, who followed a man for different reasons, but lost their lives, 918. So we, we wanna talk about Black Lives Matter. If we really believe all lives matter, how is it that we've gotten to this point and so many people never knew that this was the case? There was, there was suffering, human suffering of all kinds, but the largest toll was, was on the African-Americans in that, in that church congregation. It seemed almost like they were throwaway people because when there were so many requests to try to get them to come back, and you see so many excuses that were offered. Well, you know, there's a separation between church and state. Well, we really shouldn't go in because the government shouldn't be messing around with the church. Even when the families kept saying, no, there is something wrong. There's something very wrong. And there we was need evidence to investigate. Of that. Yeah, yes. there was plenty of evidence of what was going on that was wrong at that time. I think... It's hard to believe that a man who was once um, recognized and cherished for his good work is now this beast. And that's what he was. No, it was, they were in the United States. Am I understanding correctly? They were, it was started in the United States. He started getting investigated and then he went, took his um, people over to Ghana. Yes, Guyana. Guyana, okay. Yes, and they did that, he did that to escape the, the, the findings from the investigation. Mm. So one of the participants um, made a comment that was very interesting and said, and, and discussed the, the amount of hours that they put into the agricultural project, the hours that they put into the church service and, and, and recruiting and um, politically helping those who were supporting the church. And 
um, this participant said that they, they worked day and night, would leave the full-time job, come and work again mm. on another project that was related to the church, sleep for several hours, and then get up and do it all over again. And on payday, would bring their check and turn it over, turn it over to the, the church. And so the question was, well, did you get something back? And the participants said, yes, I got 50 cents. And someone said, well, that's better than, you know, the next person who didn't get anything back. And this, this participant said, I never got anything back because that 50 cent went into the Coke machine for me to treat myself to a soda. So in actuality, his blood, sweat, and tears, right? The soda, everything, the check, everything was turned over to the church. Wow. We, we see and we know, you know, from everything that we've read that Jonestown created this nirvana, if you will. And I think everybody wants to find nirvana, even though we know it doesn't exist. <laughs> he, he gave the impression that this place is going to solve every problem that you have here. And I do think that some people believed him. They believed we're going to go to paradise because, you know, you're in a rainforest. You have these beautiful tropical plants and you know you had houses and when you look at some of the pictures and I'll show some you show them in the middle of this beautiful beautiful rainforest so you would think it was almost like a sales pitch to say I'm taking you to paradise and then you get there and Leslie talked about you know there was there were food shortages yes that's, that's not paradise and yes. you know the 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 labor and for yes. the locals to think it was a slave camp and <laughs> never do anything to, about it and it, never did anything about it. When you when you do research and you look at the pictures, there is nothing other than the promo videos that gives you the impression that it is um, paradise. Mm -hmm.